You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network. You're listening to the Undisputed Wrestling Show with your host, the Prophet Rick Craig, the Bearded Wonder Zane Paisley, and the Morning Star William Huckabee. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to what I consider the greatest weekly wrestling podcast in all of podcast history, the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Tonight, I'm your host, the NWA Continental Champion, the morning star, Will Huckabee. Unfortunately, tonight, our esteemed prophet, Rick Craig, nor Doss Wonderbeard will be with us, but it's okay, because you got me with you. And also on the line, we have what I consider the the godfather of not only North Carolina, but the mid Mid Atlantic uh, independent wrestling scene, uh, former uh, former you know champion at so many different promotions, uh, veteran, well traveled wrestler, the one, the only Q Ball Carmichael. Q Ball, how are you doing tonight? Hey, Will, what's going on? Hey, Kevin, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm doing good. I think that you could probably do your introduction better than I can. Uh, <laughs> so, you uh, want to. I can give you a quick rundown. 1983, graduated uh, Peter Maivia's wrestling school at Ciroc's grandfather's. Uh, wrestled in Hawaii for a couple of years, moved back to uh, Virginia. Wrestled for a couple. In 1988, I went and trained for eight months with the great Lou Fez and uh, perfected my game a little bit, and I've been out there ever since. And, you know, I've uh, <laughs> been around from 96 to 2000. I was a regional enhancement guy for the WWE when they were the WWF and uh, has held NWA titles in three different decades and uh, continue to be out there every once in a while, even now. Such a, a huge resume um, with, with so many accomplishments and so many things that you've done, not only in professional wrestling, but also, you know, in your personal life, you know, running a multi-million dollar business and everything else. How hard is it for you to stay humble uh, with all those accomplishments underneath your belt? Well, you know, I, I think there was a period in my life, Will, where I wasn't very humble. And, you know, our 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 Lord has a way of humbling us. And, you know, it's no secret. I, I, I put it out there because I can't help anybody if I don't. I went through a couple of bouts of serious addiction. And, uh, you know, the last one I went through, I had a four-bedroom house in New Jersey, which anybody knows is not cheap. I had a brand-new Jaguar, a brand-new SUV, brand-new Harley Davidson. I owned a multi-million dollar business, and I proceeded to to fall into addiction again, and within a year or two, I'd lost everything and was homeless. So, you know, I've rebuilt my life from the ground up. I've been clean over five years. I put it back together. I have a beautiful home, a wonderful wife who's much younger and more attractive than me, uh, three wonderful children, and I'm starting to train my son now to wrestle. So, you know, life is good to me, and at this point in my life, I think it's really easy for me to be humble because I know that without the grace of God, that I would be probably not here anymore. So I am forever thankful and grateful for that um, and for people that rallied around me to try to pull me out of the funk when I was in it. So, you know, I've had a lot of people reach out and, and uh, you know, try to get help through me and things. And it's always very humbling. And it's just something where, you know, I, I think that when we're not humble in life, it's only going to last so long. And then, you know, the, the good Lord is going to humble us and bring us to our knees. And they say to take your takes until you can take no more. And then the Lord take it away. And that is exactly the case of me. So I think now it's easier than it was years ago. Now, you're so right about that. Now, speaking about rebuilding, uh, you're completely rebuilding your image, basically. Uh, you know, you got the school going on, and we'll get to that later. Uh, but, you know, a couple years ago, and, and no, offense to, no offense to you whatsoever, you know, you came out, and it almost seemed like out of nowhere, here comes cue ball Carmichael, even though you know, You've been involved in the Mid-Atlantic wrestling scene for years, for decades. Uh, you came out with Cue Ball uh, Consolidations, and that consisted of you, Lou Martoni, Pat Cusick, uh, and, and Sean, uh, Mark Denny, I'm sorry. And now you're right. back at Omega Wrestling, you know, with what well, I consider Cue Ball Consolidations version two. Uh, what is the difference, you know, between the two? Because now you're no longer an active uh, a wrestler, and we'll get to that also. Uh, but you're more, you know, uh, uh, the man behind the wrestler. So, what's the version two going on? 
Well, you know, I, I, I think, once again, it's a, it's a way of being humbled. I had the fold originally with Sean Denny and Pat Houston and myself and Lou Marconi in it, and we dominated the NWA for a while and did real well. Um, and then we kind of went our separate ways for a while. And, uh, you know, I think the resurgence is this. Well, I left the business in 2009, and I, I don't want to say that I left it. I, I just walked away from it. I was I was frustrated. I hadn't gotten clean yet. Things Things were just bothering me way too much. And I said, you know what, before I can get back in this, I got to clean up my own lifestyle because I had a great reputation my entire life in the business being ethical and honest, and I didn't want to put that on the line. So I just stepped away for about a year and a half, and Damien Wings, the guy that got me off the couch, um, we had met at a show in 2009, stayed in touch, and, you know, I was very popular in the Tidewater area of Virginia. I had a, you know, I was a VCW, NWA, Virginia champion, and held some titles down there, and I have a real big following at Tidewater and always have. And so Damien came in on the tail end of that and said, you know, I never got to experience that. I think you got a lot of less to teach, and you can help a lot of people, and I want you to come back. And, so, you know, I, I didn't really want to, but I did, and, and I came back and was wrestling a lot, and then about a year and a half ago, I got serious about getting in a good physical con- condition and lost about 45 pounds, and, you know, I, I just think that I started to, when I got back into business, before I did that, I said, you know, I gotta, I was on Facebook and I said, I got to put some stuff out there. I can't be the only guy that thinks like this, and I started putting stuff out there, and Guys like Tracy, some others who I've known for 20 years would, would, you know, send me messages and say, you're right, and bull pain. And, you know, a lot of veterans would say, that's exactly the way I feel. So I started to feel like that I wasn't the only one that felt this way. And I started to put it out there. And, you know, some people I offend and some people become haters and other people drink the Kool-Aid and jump on the bandwagon. But all I really do is, is, as you know, is talk a lot. And I always tell myself the match of the obvious. If I point out obvious things in wrestling that are problems, that are issues, obvious things that are good in the business, you know, and try to do that, I, I think what's happened by being honest and put myself out there and being willing to take the hits from the few people that don't agree with me, it's made me more almost like, you know, if you can say it on Facebook, a pop culture figure, because a lot of people come to me with advice and ask me things, not just about wrestling, but about life or problems or or whatever, they've gotten in shape because they've seen the transformation that I've made. So, you know, I, I, I never really thought of myself as the inspirational guy, um, but I've come to the realization that people are inspired by honesty and hard work. And if, if, if I do that on a daily basis and it inspires people, then so be it. And if it, my whole goal is with, with whatever I do, whether it's behind the scenes and whether it's, you know, being the director or the actor or whether it's running the training center, is I want to improve the overall landscape of the wrestling business. I want to do what I can to try to make this better than it was last year or the year before this year. And next year I want to try to make it better than that. So that's really my motivation and goal to try to do it. But you also have to do it in a caring, loving, and humble way. Oh, yeah. You know, you you, you say being humble and, and it's, you know, the big news is, you know, you've currently retired, I guess you could say, as an active in-ring participant. Well, you, you know, here's the thing is I never used the R word. Remember I said I've never used the R word because I just got <laughs> I, I just got posted in the fall in several matches with Nature Boy Buddy Landell. is more of a favorite to him than anything else. He's like, work me, work me. And I'm like, oh, okay, if we can get some dates and boom, we're booked in Texas and we're booked in Virginia. So, you know, I'll, I, I make exceptions to rule but. At this point, what's got to happen is the match has to mean something to me personally. If there's a personal connection, Landell and I worked together the first time 20 years ago. You know, we've been we've been great friends for 20 years, and you know, when a guy like that reaches up and says, "You're the guy I want to go in there with," you know, it's hard to say no. Well, the reason why I say that is because it seems like you know, ever since you made that announcement, that we won't use the R word, but we'll say that you're going to slow down. Um, right. You be, you've seen you you become even busier than <laughs> usual. <laughs> you know what? It, it never goes as planned, right? I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna step I'm gonna step back, and I I come off the road, and and uh, you know I was going uh once a month, ten hours each way to Pittsburgh, and I was still doing some North Carolina stuff, and some guys wanted me to do seven hours in Florida and Alabama, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna come off the road and just take it easy and regroup, and I was home about a month, I looked at my wife, and I said, I think I'm going to open up a wrestling training center. She goes, 
if it'll keep you home and you're going to be happy because you're not going to be happy unless you're involved in a business, go ahead. So, <laughs> you know, it's like I don't think we'll ever be happy if we're not in it in some capacity. Now, exactly. Now, for everybody who, who follows you on social media, especially Facebook and stuff, you know, big news is you finally signed the, the lease for your building and stuff. You have a building. Are you ready to release the name? Of your training center. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get the exclusive, too. I got to get the exclusive. I, I, I will give it to you. I promise. I can't do it now. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, I. it's funny. My guy over in UK, Jazz Kumar, who does all my graphics, JK, uh, but does a great job and has worked tirelessly, tirelessly for me. Um, he has, he does a lot of branding for major companies. He does a lot of MMA and UFC things and a lot of outside businesses. And when we picked the name out of all the people that, that submitted uh, in the contest we had, which was over 195 submissions, um, and some of those had two and three in each one, 195 different people with two or three in some of them. So it was over 250. We picked one we liked because I thought that, you know, maybe the people out there should name it versus me. I think it would be less egotistical and more humble. So I let that happen. So we decided on one, and we're currently building the, the logo and the brand for it. So once we have that, we're going to announce that. But we're probably at least two weeks away, maybe three. By June 1st, I'm hoping. So yeah, I, I promise to give you guys the exclusive. Oh, now, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that. She was going to come back within two, three weeks. We'll say about around June 1st. He's gonna, we're going to go ahead and give you a call. I'm like, hey, t are you ready to go ahead and release that name yet? Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, okay, you got your school. Now, how... Is because you know we all everybody's seen the WWE training center stuff for NXT and stuff, and they got the fancy the fancy rings and the the crash rings for the high flyers and stuff, and the cameras where Triple H can watch training and stuff all the way to Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that your training facility is going to be very back to the basics, old school training, uh, where guys have to get in condition and learn how to work. Uh, is that a, a correct uh, guess? You could not have hit the nail on the head any better. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is, is can I do what they do and, and sink the money and technology into it? No. So what do I do? Do I try to be an imitator like a lot of big companies have and have failed miserably? No. I have to be an innovator, and my innovation has to be a retro training center. It's going to be first class. It's going to be super clean. It's got a lot of cool banners and posters hanging in it, some nostalgia, uh, but what it is, it's an old school training center. You know, we, we start out, my guys start out with a thousand Hindu squats. You know, it's not easy. Um, as I said before, when I ran a school in Virginia with Jimmy Cicero and, you know, he graduated Joey Matthews, became Joey Mercury and Christian York and Otto Schwanz and went to WWE's jacked up. And, you know, we were very successful. JC North came out of there. Um, we were very successful, but we ran a very regimented training center. We took half what I learned at Luthez's and half of what Jimmy had learned at Ivan Koloff's, and we we molded that together. So, you know, that's kind of the model that I'm going to do. You have to be a little bit more cautious these days because, as I say, when I was trained 32, 33 years ago, you know, if you did to people today what they did to me in training, they wouldn't put you in jail. They'd put you underneath the jail. So we have to... You know, we have to be politically correct, but the guys are going to have to learn, learn to work hard. And, you know, I think if you work hard and you get in shape and you earn the right to be in that ring and the right to wrestle, and, you know, all my guys, I, I have been very fortunate. I just hired a guy who was a former survivalist training trainer in the Marine Corps, a retired staff sergeant. He was a two-time Michigan State wrestling champion in high school and a two-time collegiate wrestling champion at Michigan State. And he's going to teach the amateur side of wrestling. I'm going to teach more of the hook style. And then, we're, of course, we're going to work together and teach the guys the pro style. So these guys will be pretty well-rounded. They'll be able to protect themselves. And uh, I think they'll be able to go out there and get marketed right away and get some work. So, you know, that's kind of the goal. Once again, as I said, everything I do is... It, 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 in concept, and, you know, conceptually, sometimes it doesn't always come out on paper, but my goal is to improve the overall landscape of the pro wrestling business, and I think it's got to start at a grassroots level, and I think it has to start on the independence, and, and you know, I've already said I'm going to open my school all day Saturday, all day Sunday to any wrestlers anywhere in the country who want to come here and train for a very minimal fee, 
and I will be there each day, and I will be happy to help instruct and critique these guys because all that's going to do is make what we do better. You know, you and I was going to ask that, like, how often were you going to be at the school? Because, of course, a lot of times, you know, with the exception being, you know, uh, Danny Cage up there, the Monster Factory and stuff, uh, and a couple others, uh, most of the time, you know, guys open this training school, they, they slap their name on it, and then they have somebody else basically run the school for them. Uh, I'm so glad you have gone ahead and said, that, hey, you will be there on hand to give guys critiques and everything because you've helped out so many guys, uh, not, not only myself, but a number of other uh, younger guys in this business get better, get in shape, and actually learn how to work and not just do spots. Uh, I'm going ahead and I'm going to assume that a lot of your friends, Bull Payne, um, you know, Tracy Smothers, all of them will be doing guest training seminars and everything. But can you tell us who will actually be some of your other trainers that we can count on uh, to be white regulars at the school? Well, I can tell you that I will be there seven days a week. You know, I when I opened this school, I, I ended up having to renovate this building and it was uh, not cheap for me, and it wasn't cheap for the guy who's a wonderful local businessman who owns the building to get this remodeled. But it is exactly one quarter of a mile from the front door of my house. And I did that for a reason, so that there's no excuse why I can't be at that school every minute that that school is open. Because, you know, as much as I bring in a guy who's going to train for me, I, I've owned several very successful home improvement businesses and nobody works harder than the owner and if he's a smart and nobody sells better than the owner and nobody's going to work harder at that school than me and nobody's going to train harder at that school than me because ultimately at the end of the day, it's my name that's on that baby and everything that comes out of there is going to be a direct reflection of me and the problem is that I've had success doing this before and I've put some guys out there that were successful. So I have to continue to do that. Otherwise, anything else is going to be let down. So I, it, it's really going to take a lot of hard work. But I plan on being, I'm the head trainer. I'm going to be there seven days a week. You know, I've got uh, Jose Flores, who just retired from Marine Corps. You know him, he wrestled with Bobby Wolfer. He's going to do the amateur side of the training for me. Great guy, lives close. And I've already talked to Les Thatcher and Buddy Landell and Tracy Smothers and Paul Payne and some other veterans about coming in and, you know, doing seminars and training for us, guest seminars and guest training and things like that. You know, my whole goal is to just make this something where it's affordable and there's no excuses for anybody that, does, that wants to come and better themselves not to be there. Now, this is something that I ask a lot of guys, myself personally. It's something that I think is needed today, especially with the, with the way the world is now and stuff. What is your take? I know that you're, you are so active on social media. Uh, for any of the, for any young wrestlers who are listening to this podcast, if you're not a member of Q-Ball's private group, Q-Ball's Corner Pocket, uh, you need to send a request in, you know, message Q-Ball, call Michael, and ask to be a part of this group because there's so much useful information, not only from Q-Ball, but from other events, such as Tracy Smothers, uh, Axel Rodden, uh, Bull Payne, Danny Cage, Mike Howell, all of these great veterans are there in this group. Uh, at your school, Q-Ball, are you going to have a class to teach these guys uh, how to use social media effectively and what to do and what not to do. Because I'm sure that you see uh, guys posting the social media that they should never post. Yeah. You know, there's such a thing as social media responsibility. Um, and that, that's a, that's a double edged sword. You are ultimately going to be held responsible and accountable for everything you put out there. You know, I was talking with Lou Marconi the other day and, I find it ironic that my grandfather, who came to this country in 1912, I can go online and look up where he signed into Ellis Island. I can look at the ship that he came over on. I can look where he was born and raised. I can look at who sponsored him as an indentured servant for the first five years he was here. Do you think in 1912 he ever thought his grandson would be able to see that in 2015? Absolutely not. And I'm telling people right now, whether you know it or not, the WWE, TNA, all these groups, Jeff Jarrett's group is going to do it too. If they're going to think about signing you, they're going to go back to your Facebook page and they're going to go back a year or two or three. They have people that do that. And all they're looking for is something that could possibly can be confused as compromising to your integrity. And you are not going to get looked at or signed no matter how damn good you think you are. 
So before you go put something out there into cyberspace and it's going to stay there forever plus a day, you had better think very carefully about what you put out there because it will come back to bite you in the ass. Now, to uh, you know, I wouldn't be a journalist if I didn't ask this. Are you talking about this from experience? I know the answer to this, but for our listeners, I have Absolutely. to ask. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, you know what? Every mistake, every wrestler listens to this show thinks they've made, I've made it twice. <laughs> so, but you know, it only takes shame on me once, shame on me twice. Third time ain't gonna happen. I'm smarter than that. I get it. But yeah, you know, we put stuff out there. I mean, I was told a year and a half ago by a guy at the top who's been a friend of mine for 18 years. Q, if you would just shut your mouth and quit putting stuff out there, you'd have a job with us in a year. And I said, well, I'm not going to stop. So I guess I'm not going to get a job with it. You know, because I want to put it out there. And once again. Not the compromising, but I, at this point, at my age, I'm not going to go anywhere. The only chance of a job is maybe an agent job someday with Jeff or somebody. And the fact of the matter is that what I put out there in my heart of hearts and in my mind is the gospel, it's the truth, it's the way it is, it's the way it was, it's the way it should be. I don't profess to be the alpha or the omega, but I am a big part of the equation somewhere stuck in the middle, and I get it. I understand what made this business great. I also understand what compromised this business. And to get it back to where it was, we have to start making it great and doing the right things again. And, you know, I'm not afraid to put that out there because what's it going to do to me? You know, I have a great shoot job. I have a wonderful life. I'll train my students, whoever come, you know. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. I can, you know, I can't force you to drink the Kool-Aid, but I can tell you that once you have a few cups of it, it's pretty damn good. Exactly. Now. Shifting on shifting over the gears and stuff, uh, and you say you working as an agent. Something that I never thought I would see before is Kumar Carmichael in a striped uh, baby blue and yellow sports coat. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like an Easter basket, didn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, I, now I see that you, you know, you, you've been influenced by Jim Cornette with the sports coat. Um, and, and for everybody listening. Uh, we're talking about you are now a, a manager and a very active manager, if I say so myself, and Omega Wrestling. Uh, how did that all come? How did it all come together with you managing uh, C.W. Anderson? Well, you know, I had wrestled on the first uh, three, two or three Omega shows, um, and they knew that. You know, I had shared with Shane and Mike that, that at that point I really wanted to get behind the scenes. Um, and do more because as a wrestler, you know, in a match, you can affect affect X amount of people. Behind the scenes doing things, you can affect a larger portion of people. You know, a wrestler affects, you know, goes in front of 200 people and has a match, he affects them. But if the promoter runs the show, the show is tight, all the matches are good, he draws 200, then 500, then 800, then 1,000, you have a chance to affect more people. So the position that they have available really um, we discussed a couple of them. We decided because I was pretty good on a microphone and I'm not very shy, as most good wrestlers aren't, um, that, that it would be a good spot for me to be a manager for CW. So when we started to put this together, Shane Helms had a great idea that I should dress almost like the Saul, who is the lawyer on Breaking Bad, who has his own show now. It should be bright and flamboyant. And I'm like, I agree with you. And at first I wore black and it kind of looked like Eddie Brown security. And then I went out and invested some money and I bought a, that powder blue sport coat, which I thought would get heat, but it actually looked good. I got too many compliments on it. So then I went and I bought a yellow one, a purple seersucker suit, and then I bought that plaid one. It was funny when I bought that, the lady said at the store, she said, oh, is this for Easter? Because it was like a week before Easter. I said, no, man, it's not. She says, really? I didn't want to tell her, I'm like, yeah, no, it's not for something else. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, but that was, the, that was the hit of the day. I put it on, and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, this can get so much heat. And, it, you know, oh. to me, I mean, it looked like an Easter basket that had it unwrapped. <laughs> you, you know, I didn't, I wasn't at the last Omega show, but I was at the, uh, the show where Jeff Hardy had won the Omega Championship before his, right. before his tragic accident and stuff, and you wore that suit to that show. And I was sitting in the crowd in the middle, you know, I bought my ticket and stuff because I support, whenever I'm not working and stuff, I, I right. always try to support right. whatever show I go to. But I'm sitting in the middle of like, I want to say they had like over a thousand people there. 
And almost everybody around me talked about how horrible that suit looked and how much they hated that suit. <laughs> that, you know, listen, listen, what's that, what's that old saying? <laughs> you want them talking about you, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, as long as they're talking about you, it's a good thing. So, you know, it got, it got the comments it was supposed to get, oh my God, it's idiot. And, you know, that and the heel manager, I don't want to wear something that's kind of going to look good on me. So, you know, I think it accomplished what we wanted to do. I think it made me stand out. I think it made people look at me and shake their heads and go, that's just not good. <laughs> oh, exactly. Now, you know, you being a manager, that's something that I, something else I wanted to get your opinion about is that do you think that the the manager, not valet or whatever, you know, a piece of eye candy just walks with God for race, but an actual wrestling manager, do you think there's still a spot for wrestling managers in professional wrestling, and especially on the indie? And how do we get oh, back oh, to absolutely. that? Oh, absolutely. I think there is. The problem is, is that we've gone to the tough guy stage, and you got managers out there wearing polo shirts and a leather jacket. you got managers out there wearing black. you got managers out there wearing cowboy outfits, biker outfits. That's not the manager that ever got over in the business. So you got, people need to go back to when mouthpieces were used. You know, and on top of that, there are a lot of guys, both at WWE and TNA should never be on the microphone. They're just not good. They can't deliver, you know, and that, that being said, I'm not saying me, but you should put them with somebody that can talk, that can use voice inflections and can get what they're doing over. And that's a forgotten art. I mean, I watch some guys and I'm like, I just look at him and I'm like, I can't believe you're even giving him the mic. Three years ago, this guy would have not gotten near a mic. You know, it's the same thing with, for example, if you, uh, you know, I'll give you a good example. Um, Kamala, the Ugandan giant, James Harris, nicest guy in the world, southern accent, from Tennessee, truck driver. If that man had ever spoken, that gimmick would have been ruined, you know. He never spoke. It was always a manager. It was always Kim Chi's hand or whatever. But, you know, there's a lot of guys who would be a lot more ominous, a.k.a. threatening, if they didn't speak. And they had a manager speak for him. I'll give you a classic example. I think the worst thing they could have done was put Roman Reigns on the mic. I just don't think it was a good idea. It, you know, whether you're trying to over heel or as a baby face, I just don't think it was a good idea. I think it immediately deflated the balloon. You know, if you have steam, uh, as a guy's got steam and he's building, whether he's building to be a baby face or a heel, you got to be very protective and cautious of that because one false move and all that effort is gone. And that's exactly what happened in, that, in the case with him. As far as I'm concerned, and there's tons of guys that shouldn't be on the stick. You know, I mean, TNA guys get on there, and I'm like, wow, that was just not a smart move. But, you know, that's my opinion, and, you know, my opinion is only my opinion. It just happens to be right. Well, you know, T-Ball, your opinion actually matters a lot because – Obviously, you have a, a proven track record of not only putting butts every six to every sixteen to eighteen inches, but also helping other any promotions coming in and helping other any promotions uh, who are not drawing as well. Case in point, RWA up there in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, Derek was drawing very well, and then he reached out for you to you for help, and now he's drawing, you know, twice as much as he was drawing before. Um, is that something that you are very interested in? I know you have your TV show coming out and stuff, but we want to talk about that before you leave. But in going out and helping other promotions build up their draw, um, you talk to them about having managers. Is that one of the things, one of the points that you actually like to bring up? Yeah. You know, I, to me, I think that's the challenge. The challenge is when a guy's running a market for six years and he's only drawn 150 because if you watch over four shows, it's never the same 150. It might be the same 80. It's never the same. So the key is to draw all of those people back consistently. And that is done with creative, not complicated, creative angles involving a few of the key wrestlers in there that leave people wanting more. In other words, a show should run two hours and 20 minutes. 20 minutes of that is intermission. It's two hours soup to nuts. You don't want to overfeed them. If you give them too much, you put them. You know as well as I do. We've all been on shows that have 11 matches go four and a half hours in a hot armory with a steel chair. Guess what? Half those people next time Russell's in town are going to go to Redbox and rent a movie, set an air conditioning, have some popcorn, spend two hours, go to bed. So the bottom line is <laughs> just the way it is. You have to understand 
that there's a certain product that you give people, intriguing, interesting, creative, dramatic, but also not easy to figure out a swerve here and there. You get them up in the end of the seat. I say this. Every time you run a show, and I ran 126 shows, I've never lost money, I've only made money. The fact of the matter is, every single time you run a show, you've got to have a who shot JR moment at the end. You've got to have that cliffhanger that was the most famous one ever in history at Dallas, where JR got shot and nobody did, knew it all summer long. And when they ran it the first time in September, it had record viewership. More of the people watched that than they ever watched the Super Bowl because they needed to see who shot JR. You need to deliver. That who shot JR moment at the end of every single show, whether you run a three hour show once a week, twice a week, two hours, whatever. And that's what WWE and TNA is not giving, is they're not giving the who shot JR moment. They're not getting creative enough. You know, they're not laying people down one road and swerving them to the left and people going, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. That's what has to be done. When wrestling becomes predictable, it becomes boring and people tune out. So you can never let it get to that point. And that's the hardest thing to get people to understand because everybody fancies themselves as a promoter, uh, a young Vince McMahon, they're going to build this, they're going to build this, but yet they have no concept or they can't conceptualize, conceptualize what it takes to run a show that is intriguing, interesting, and creative and dramatic and leaves people hanging on that, oh, my God, who shot JR? i got to be back at the next show and see how this ends. That's what's missing. Now, you talk about the who shot JR moment that going there and these, promo- these promoters and stuff. Uh, you, and I've read it several times, have certain rules that anybody who's ever thinking about promoting a show, there are certain rules and certain things that they should know or have uh, before they even run their first show. Would you like to give us a brief synopsis, since we're already on the topic, of anybody who's out there wondering or somebody who's out there thinking right now, hey, I can run a wrestling show. These are what they need to think about before they even book the first wrestler. Sure. You know, the, the thing is, before you book the first wrestler, uh, before you do anything, the first thing is um, to book the venue, get some sponsors. But even before that, you better make sure that you're at least reasonably bankrolled. And what I mean by that is, is you should have, as far as I'm concerned, even as an independent promoter, you should have at least 5000 bucks set aside. Because it's not cheap to get advertising, and we need advertising, and it's not cheap to get radio spots. You know, a simple recipe to fill a building is, you know, I mean, you, you, once the show is sold and once you're in there, once you've got the venue, make sure you have everybody's money in the envelope before you sell ticket one. And then understand that your job is not to be the superstar that night. Your job is not to put yourself over. Your job is to fill the building. That's what promoters do. Uh, and by default, unfortunately, most of them are the guys who run the shows and want to be the star of the show. That's never ever going to work again. Wrestling has changed too much. You cannot be the heavyweight champion. You cannot push yourself and draw volumes of people on a consistent basis. It's not going to happen. You have to get back behind the curtain. You have to organize and direct this thing just like a movie. You know, it's real simple. And C.W. Anderson taught me this. He said, wrestling is no more than a really good Michael Bay movie. Whether you take Armageddon or whether you take Transformers. It starts out with boom, boom, boom. Lots of action get their attention, then settle in and tell a story. And that's a wrestling match out there. That's what you have to do to get people involved. But, you know, promoters, I'm telling you, have 5000 bucks, have all the boys' money in the envelope, and just forget about being on the show or being part of the show or being a manager or a wrestler. Promote the damn show. Get out and beat the street. But, but Cuba, but, but, but Cuba, what about all these guys who, you know, all these – these these indie guys or indie marks who think they know the business and say, "Well, hold on. What about Jerry Lawler and, and the guy in the, in the Grams down there in, in Tennessee sure, and Florida sure, and stuff? Sure. Like, and, what about all these guys? Just, they come over there with stars. What about them?" Sure, and it's just like I said, that will never work again. You know, it was a different time and era. There wasn't the exposure on the internet. There wasn't the exposure in social media. People didn't know at the time that they were the guys behind the scenes. Hell, do you think anybody knew for 20 years Vince McMahon owned the WWE until 1997? They didn't because there was no way to find out. He acted as an announcer and nothing more, and that's the men- that, that was the mentality. Not everybody knows what's going on. I mean, you can't hide anything. So if you put yourself out there, you're getting accused of you know pushing yourself or putting your family out there. It's nepotism. But what will happen is that will turn people away. 
So what you got to do is be content and be happy to organize and promote. And the other thing, too, is if you're worried about your main event match with this guy and you're just trying to, you know, get over as the champion, you're not going to go out there and promote the show correctly. It's just not going to happen. And that's the biggest thing that's missing today. You know, promoters were concert promoters. They were ultimate promoters. If you go back to the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not one promoter, with the exception of maybe George Cannon, ever put themselves out there as the talent or as the wrestler. Lawler did it, but Lawler also understand that Lawler was in a territory where a lot of guys were coming and going, and he was always going to be there, and he was always going to be the star, and he certainly put his share of guys over. You know, but I think those days are done. Good done. I think what you've got to do is you've got to go out there, and you've got to be willing to be behind the curtain, and you've got to be willing to work for the better part of the show, and you need to get, you know, I, I talk about it all the time, <laughs> community awareness program. If I go into a town, and every fireman and every policeman and every town council member does not know that professional wrestling was in that town that night, that show will fail, guaranteed. If you have social awareness, if the police department, the fire department, the schools, if all these places, the stores, the local businesses, they're all talking about this big event, that's why Omega does so good. They go into a town and they get everybody involved in the police and the fire department, everybody knows they're there in that town and they're running a show and it'll be the last time they're there this year and they draw 1,000, 1,200 people consistently. You know, and they, and Mike Howell doesn't wrestle on the shows and Mike was a good wrestler as Mike Maverick. I wrestled him many times. Avery Coach was a wrestler as David Taylor. They don't wrestle on the show. They promote the show. They're busy. They're out there doing business for the show. <laughs> That's what's got to happen if you're going to be a successful promoter. You are never going to be successful putting yourself in the limelight. Those days are long. Now, speaking of being a long man, you know, we talked about this before we got on the air, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you now. You know, you've, you've mentored uh, so many young indie wrestlers, myself, Ryan Mader, um, you know, I, Jesus, the, name, the list goes on and on. I can't really think of all the guys um, that you've helped out, not only uh, how to work, but also physique-wise. Uh, for anybody that's aspiring to not only do this more than once a weekend, you know, uh, but they actually want to try to make a go at it and try to get signed by Jeff Jarrett at GFW or go to Japan or something. Uh, what's your advice for them? And what do you see that's not being done on the Indies that could probably help these guys out even more? Well, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, four or five of my friends have gotten signed with <coughs> Jeff Groups. Sanjay Dutt did. Uh, Chase Stevens did. Cassidy Riley did. Luke Hawks did. Uh, big, big, um, Luke Gallows did. You know, and all these guys, these guys that got signed share one thing in common. At no point in their life did they consider themselves a weekend warrior. Yes, they had to do that to survive, but that's not what they considered themselves. All of them went to the gym. All of them trained. All of them tanned. All of them spent money on gear. All of them traveled every weekend. But all of them thought all the time that this was what they were going to do full-time and for a living. They were out there. They were committed. They were dedicated. You know, I'd say... You know, passion, people say, oh, I'm passionate about it. Bullshit. If you're passionate about wrestling, you'll go to the gym, you'll work out, you'll tan, you'll improve your body, you'll improve your physique. You've done it yourself, Well, These guys will go out there, you guys will go out there, and you'll work hard to better yourself and get better at what you're doing. You'll go to seminars, you know. You'll take the punches. You'll keep pushing yourself and pushing yourself. And eventually, those are the guys that good things happen to and that's what the difference is. The guy that goes out there and tells me, and I get this all the time, I'm happy working the independent a couple of shows a month. Really? Where's your pride, man? Really? You want to play professional wrestler when you could be a professional wrestler? Not me. I'm up to 55 in two weeks, and I still go to the gym four days a week, and I still can. I still do whatever it takes just in case somebody walks in and they say, wow, he looks like a professional wrestler, you know? That's the difference. I took pride in it. No matter what I did, whether I was wrestling full-time for a living in the 90s or the 80s when I wasn't or the millennium when I wasn't, if you ask me what I did for a living, and I made tons of money in the home improvement business, had very successful businesses, but if you ask me what does Chris Jackson do for a living, he's a professional wrestler named Q-Ball Carmichael, and that was the pride I took in what I did. And that pride is not there anymore. People are content to be failures in pro wrestling. Failures as promoters draw on 100 but not having any payroll because they use free guys. 
Guys are content with learning how to wrestle on the internet or dropping out or training from somebody that doesn't know any better. You know, it's a world full of people that are accepting and embracing mediocrity in all that they do instead of trying to become a champion. You know, and it's America. Hey, listen, when I was a kid, guess what? There was first and there was second. And second was the first loser and third was the second loser. And you worked hard and you tried to be first in your team. You worked hard on your football and baseball team to try to win, you know. And then we started giving out trophies to everybody on the team because we didn't want to affect anybody's self-esteem. And we wanted all the kids <laughs> to play soccer, soccer, football. We don't want to keep score because we don't want anybody to feel like a loser. You know what? Grow <laughs> up, America. The fact of the matter is there's winners and there's losers. And many losers eventually become winners because they're motivated by seeing that and working hard to get to that point. But yet what we've done is this, no, let's all get in the middle. Let's all be nice glasses of milk with cookies. Come on, man. Somebody's got to be the thing. You know, my thinking. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> just, my, my thinking, well, just happens to be right. <laughs> you don't know. Believe me, you are right. You'll say, now, with this new show coming up, you want to draw fans? You know, it's a TV show that you had development and stuff and that you got coming out very soon. Because I'm assuming that how you are now is what we're going to see right there on our TV screen in our living room. Well, you know, it's funny. When we shot our pilot episode, the uh, director who has done all the commercials for the last five years for the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army and was a CNN bureau chief came up to me and said, holy crap. I'm like, what? He goes, I just watched you back on camera and the camera loves you. I said, Really? I think I got a face for radio. And he said, not like that. You're so sincere, you're so sincere and so genuine that people are never going to doubt what you're saying. You're so convinced of what you're saying. Because it's the truth, dude. And he goes, well, that doesn't even matter what you're convinced of it. And so, you know, we, we filmed some episodes, and right now it's being shot. And our last one was Destination America told us a couple months ago that if uh, – TNA continues to be their number one draw that they're going to revisit this um, in June and maybe we'll be moving forward and filming some more episodes and getting that in the air. So, you know, never say never. Uh, we worked real hard in a few episodes. We've got some good stuff in the can. And we, you know, we made an improvement everywhere we went. And, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, if it's meant to be, you know how I feel. If it's meant to be, it'll happen. And if it's not, it won't. Well, of course. And that's, and that's just the way the life is. And that's, just watching you is is in the example. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen eventually. You know, you don't seem like a man that says, "Hey, I'm going to do this," and then gives up on it. You never, know what I'm saying? Never, <laughs> never give up. Never, never give up. Never surrender. Fight to the very end. Go down kicking. Exactly. Um, I mean, there's so many things we could talk about, Q Ball. You know, we could talk about what you feel is wrong with indie wrestling right now, and not just indie wrestling. Although I'm more, you know. I'm more prone to talk about indie wrestling because we all know about the WWE and the TNA and their problems and stuff. Uh, but how do you feel about the state of indie wrestling, especially here in the Mid-Atlantic, you know, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, even Tennessee? How do you feel about it? Um, here's my thinking, and, and this is what I see that's wrong with wrestling all across the board. And this is this is the first thing to have you fixed. And, you know, there's a myriad of things you can point to, the Internet, exposure, breaking kayfabe, whatever. But the bottom line is nobody knows how to sell anymore. Let me explain that. True professional wrestling, and, and people don't like it when I say this, but it's true. Pro, pro, true professional wrestling came from the carnival days, and it was a con. And it was a con to get the audience to believe that I was beating somebody up really bad, and they were fighting insurmountable odds and keep coming back and eventually beat me fairly. Um, and that was the con, and that's what made the business. Now, there are no baby faces, because a baby face survives on selling because he gets sympathy. And sympathy is what makes a baby face survive. Now, he can't dead fish sell. He's got to be Rocky Balboa, always trying to get up the ropes and stand up. But he has to sell. There's no heat for the heel unless the face sells. The heat, the heel can get zero heat without a good sell. Everything starts and ends with the sell. If you know how to sell the baby face, if you sell like Ricky Morton or you sell like, sell like uh, Ricky Sebo did, guess what? You can wrestle anybody and you can get them over as a super heel because you know how to sell. And that's the problem with the business. If you don't sell, 
And if you don't get sympathy and you don't get heated and healed because of that sympathy, those people watching will not emotionally invest in you because they'll be looking at it and saying it's bullshit. That's why half of our fans have left and went to MMA, because they feel that that's not a work, even though it's a stiff work. They feel it isn't. So what happens is they have decided that they can't invest, they can't suspend belief, they can't get into what we do, and we have started to draw a crowd. If you look at WWE's WrestleMania this year and 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you'll see an incredible mix of the audience. You'll see old people, young people, middle-aged people, kids, grandfathers, grandmothers. If you watch it last year, you'll see privileged children, 15 to 19, sitting in all those front row seats because those are the only people that believe what's going on because what's happening now that they're watching looks like a damn video game going 100 miles an hour. Nobody's selling anything. But you know what? Those kids go to college. They get smart, and all of a sudden, they're insulted by that because they know that that can't be real. I've watched some MMA with my buddies. I've seen some UFC. That can't be real. You can't hit a guy in the face and kick him in the face. You get a Superman knee, and he gets up and comes right back at you without selling it. So, you know, that, that whole lack of a sell affects our business top to bottom, soup to nuts. It makes people not invest in us. It makes it not look real, not look authentic. You know, for years, our business was people didn't really know for sure. You know, they didn't really know for sure. But people are willing to suspend belief. Guess what? New Mission Impossible movie coming out. You know, if you think that those people believe that Tom Cruise is that Ethan character that he plays in, 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 in Mission Impossible series, they know he's Tom Cruise. They know he's an actor. They know he's not a Superman and he's an action fighter and he can ride a motorcycle like this and, you know, get blown up and live through it. They know that's bullshit. But they want to be entertained. So guess what? If it looks real and I can suspend belief and not be insulted, then I'm going to watch it and it's going to make millions. The problem with wrestling is now it's not believable because there's no sell. And because there's no sell, people don't invest. And because they don't invest, they don't suspend belief. And that's why audiences across the board from WWE house shows to independent shows are at an all-time low. Now, Q-Ball, what do you got to say, you know, because... Triple H has made some big acquisitions in the last couple of years, you know, with El Generico and Pac, who is now Neville, and he just signed Kevin Owens and, and, and everything, and the ROH style, you know, where the guys are basically Superman and no-selling. Uh, what do you have to say to your detractors who say, hey, this must be working, because all these guys who work this Superman, quote-unquote, strong style with this less selling and more action are the ones getting signed. Uh, what do you right. have to say to these people? Right, but I can tell you it doesn't work because if it did, Ring of Honor would fill 50,000 seat arenas and sell out their pay-per-views, and they don't do it because it doesn't work. So WWE is a mark for these guys because, see, WWE is different. Ring of Honor is trying to be pro wrestling. WWE is not pro wrestling anymore. It hasn't been in years. It's sports entertainment. And everything they do is marketed once again to what I said, that 14 to 20-year-old person who hasn't gotten wise to it yet just like the same people that market video games to that that genre, that, that cross-section of America, WWE is creating a live video game with the wrestlers. Boom, boom, bump, 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 boom, boom. High impact move, don't sell, pop up, boom, boom, boom. That's the quick fix. That's the immediate gratification. That is not the long-term answer to the problem, and they're going to find that out eventually. The long-term answer to the problem is to go back and create believable characters to get guys to learn to sell, to make it look as authentic and real as it can so that you get people across America to emotionally invest, to spend belief, and come back to pro wrestling. But the problem is, is everybody buys into this boom, 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 bigger, better bullshit. And, you know, Triple H has made some good acquisitions, but he's made some terrible ones, too. He's made, El Generico is not going to draw a dime for WWE. I'm sorry, he's great. I, I think he's awesome. But he's not drawing money. You know, Cesaro is a great wrestler. She doesn't draw. If you watch some of these guys during matches, the crowd looks like an oil painting. It's still life because you can't go like that, that speed, that fast with those high impact moves and pop back up like toast because people, you know, people may not know that it's not real, but they know something's up or something's wrong. And I can always tell you, same thing in an independent show. During a match, look out in the audience. See how many people pick up their cell phone. If you pick up your cell phone during a match, that match should never have been on that show. I can tell you, and I'm not bragging because I work a lot of really good guys, and I'm fortunate, but I can tell you if Damien Wayne and I go out there tomorrow in front of 500 people, there ain't going to be one person on that cell phone during our match, you know, and that's the way it's got to be. 
You know, it's got to be like that. And it's not. And it's, it's got to get back to that. Or it's never going to get better. That's really simply the answer. <laughs> Cuba, I'm so grateful that you could be on this show. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, we could have a two-hour show with just you talking you know about one. wrestling. <laughs> Um, you know before that. I let you go, God, of course I know that. You know, like I said, I follow you and I've and I sent you personal messages and matches and asked for advice. Of course. And, of course. And I thank friends, you. We've been friends for at least three or four years that I know. Oh, yes, sir. I've tried, I've tried so much to get better. Uh, dude, would you, you like to call up family? Let me just let me just tell you. Since the first time that I saw you, you have improved tenfold. You, you are you, – your psychology – and your understanding of the cell and how to get guys over is night and day different, brother. Thank you so much. Like I said, those words that you gave me at the Harley Race Seminar, uh, when I was still green in the business and thought I knew everything about everything, and turns out I didn't know nothing about nothing, uh, <laughs> and I was basically the, the stereotypical fat indie guy who could move. <laughs> right. right. Well, that's the thing. Uh, I looked at you and said, damn, this boy can move. Can you imagine what would happen if he was in shape? And then, and then the, the sad thing with that is you worked a guy who, who really kind of blew the last spot and really made a spectacle of himself, and that didn't help your cause. <laughs> but let's not yeah. digress. Uh, huh? <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about it. Let's not digress. Yeah. Right. Um, but for all of our listeners and stuff, uh, would you like to go ahead and give a, let them find out or let them know where they can t- contact you with all of our young green wrestlers out there who are ex- inexperienced and need uh, actual vets from a legitimate vet who has been to the show, who has worked with these guys at the top, uh, and knows how to get somebody to the top, go ahead, please give them all your social media and stuff so they can contact you, please. The best thing to do is uh, my Facebook page is way full with a bunch of waiting. So you can go to Facebook, and if you're in the business in any capacity, you can go to Cue Balls Corner Pocket, and I will accept you. Send me a private message. Let me know you heard us on the show and you want to get in there, and we do a lot of tutoring in there. There's, like you said before, there's some great vets in there that are always willing to help guys. we got Axel Rotten, we got Tracy Smothers, we got Brian Clark with Adam Baum and Rath, and uh, Nick Busick or Big Billy Busick. I mean, we got a, a ton of people in there that know what they're doing. And uh, you can get me at Twitter. It's QBall469. It's not a sexual reference. That was what I was rated the first year. I was in PWI Top 500 in 1993. Well, once again, Q-Ball, thank you for being on the show. What do you got coming up? You got anything big things coming up? I know Omega's about to run the show again, so I know we're going to yeah. be there. Omega's going to run in September. Right now, we're we'll just focusing on getting the school off the ground and getting training. And I hope that you will be one of the first guys that comes down and spends a couple of days with us. Oh, you know I am. I'm, and I'm going I'm to I'm carry my buddy Joe Black in tow with me. <laughs> oh, that would, oh, that would be great. I love him. I think he's got a tremendous amount of promise. All right, Cuba. Once again, thank you uh, for being on the show. I'm definitely going to contact uh, our producer Rick. Oh, I'm sorry, our promoter and, and head host Rick, yeah. and we're just going to block yeah. out a whole two hours to talk to you with all three of us well, and stuff, and just talk about talk about rest. Beautiful. I hope Zane feels better. I hope Rick has a good night with his son at school. And uh, Kevin, thank you for producing the show. And Will, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. You too. Thank you, Cuba. Yes, sir. Adios. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Cue Ball Carmichael, veteran wrestler from the uh, oh, over here in the Mid Atlanta area. So much great information. This guy knows so much knowledge. Uh, if you really are a young wrestler who is trying to get anywhere in this business, uh, Cue Ball Carmichael is one of the guys that you need to have on your friends list. It's somebody. It's, he's someone that you need to talk to, if not daily, because he's a very busy man. So you can't talk to him daily, but. Bi-weekly, monthly, you need to talk to this gentleman, get his feedback, get his advice, join Q-Ball's Corner Pocket. Uh, and if you have time, go check him out at uh, the next Omega Wrestling show. You can go to Omega Wrestling on Facebook. Find them the next time they're running. Uh, Kev, you know what? I'm, I'm almost messed up because I haven't talked about any of our sponsors uh, because I'm having so much fun talking to Q-Ball. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show, the official podcast for this year's Heroes and Legends in Indy, the great state of Indiana, where Will Huckabee, yours truly, is banned from for some ungodly reason. Also, we're brought to you by T-ShirtWorldOrder.com. Go there, buy a shirt for some of your favorite wrestlers like Troy Miller, uh, The Bronze God, and your favorite wrestling podcast, The Undisputed Wrestling Show. Period, point blank. Go there, pick up a T-shirt, you know, send us a, a, 
a picture of you wearing your Undisputed Wrestling t-shirt. Send to us on Facebook. We'll probably promote you to say what's up, give you a shout out, whatever the case may be. Kev, this is such a great, interesting show. Are you there? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, that was a, that was a mind blowing hour. Um, you, you said, I, I gotta give you props, Will. You said before this show started that tonight's show was going to be unlike any other. And I think you pretty much delivered on that. Um, wow. I was not expect, you get, you gotta let, ladies and gentlemen, you're lucky the Anger Marks Podcast Network does not charge for podcasts because you got an hour's worth of seminar right there from one of the greats, in, legitimate greats in professional wrestling for free. That, that, and you know what, Kev, uh, you know what, Kev? I hate to cut you off, but a lot of people are, are just going to take the advice and other things that they heard tonight for granted and not realize how much money they just how much money they just saved. Yeah, this is true. I mean, I mean, sometimes you don't realize the value of what you get for something. And I, exactly. and I tell you, and I, and I, and I will, I will attest it right here. I've, I've known of Cue Ball Carmichael for years. You know, we don't know each other really personally, but we know each other through several other people in the business. And everything that he just laid down tonight is 100% legitimate. Exactly. So, uh, I'm feeling like I'm missing, I'm missing some sponsors. Oh yeah, wrestle work. The online wrestling community for wrestlers and managers and ballets, green guys and veterans to all get together with promoters and talk and chop up and talk about wrestling. It's a good site. And if you're on it's there, a great site. If, if, if you're on there, join the Angry Marks Network. We've got our own faction on there as well. Um, always looking for new members, to, you know, and, and pretty much a faction is, you know, hey, I'm just a fan of whatever this faction is. You know, let, let wrestle work know. That you you're a member of Angry Marks Podcast Network and that you've heard of them through us, or if you're already a part of it and you're listening to Angry Marks, you know, let us know. Hey, we're we're all together here. Exactly. And if you know, you can always listen to this podcast live most of the time. And of course, you can always download it on the Angry Marks Podcast dot com website, or you can go to iTunes, look up Angry Mark Podcast. Go through the list of shows, check out the, check out the Undisputed Wrestling show, download it, and then you can listen to it on your leisure. For a lot of you young indie guys out there and stuff, like I said, we just gave you an hour seminar for free. So go ahead and download it tomorrow whenever it's available on iTunes, and then when you're going to a show this weekend, listen to Q Ball Carmine. There you go. All right, who do we have on, who do we have for our next second hour guest? I'm so pumped up and I'm ready for this second hour, man. I, I think you need to stop and get a drink first, Will. All right. You call, I'm going to get me a drink, okay? Hello, comrade. How you feeling today? Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show. I'm your host for the night, the NWA Continental Champion, the Morning Star, Will Huckabee. Once again, usually around this time, Rick Craig, the Prophet, would be gone anyway, and it will be me and the Bearded Wonder, a.k.a. Doss Wonderbeard, Zane Paisley. But Zane isn't here either, so you're kind of stuck with me and Kev. Now, we just had a great first hour with uh, the Mid-Atlantic monster, Q-Ball Carmichael. But for this hour, this hour, we have something special for you. We have two guests on the line. Number one, we have our first guest is the Russian Brute, who is the manager for our other guest, Ox Baker Jr. Gentlemen, how are y'all doing today? We doing I'm great. doing good. What are you doing? <laughs> Very cool. Hey, Russian Chicago. All right, Russian, we'll need you to talk one at a time. Okay, oh, let's try this again. All right, Russian Brute, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, comrade. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And Ox Baker Jr., how are you doing tonight? I'm doing amazing. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so honored for both of you to be on our show. Uh, this is go ahead and get it. Go ahead and get the, the forensics off. Let's go ahead and get off the, from the very beginning. Uh, how did you two join forces? Uh, Russian Brute, you go ahead and tell me, what did you see when you first saw Ox Baker Jr. and stuff, and what made you want to manage him? I talked to his father, Doug, and he used to manage me. Oh, Doug said, uh, you take care of my little boy because he's going to be as good a star as you and great a star as I've ever been. So I take Ox Jr. under my wing, and I'm going to teach him how to be the dirtiest wrestler in the business. Now, Ox Baker, 
Uh, you want me to call you Ox, Baker, Junior, Jr. Which one works for you? Ox, Ox Junior is fine with me. All right, Ox Junior. Uh, we just heard the Russian brute say, you know, your your father uh, mentored him, and he made a promise that he was going to mentor you or take care of you. Uh, how did you get into the business, and who actually trained you uh, to become a professional wrestler? Uh, I've been <laughs> I've been trained by several people, but uh, I'm, I'm working mostly with the Russian brute now. He's the he's my my main mentor now, and he's he's my guiding light, and he's going to teach me how to hurt people. Really bad, really, really bad. He's gonna teach me how to hurt people so bad that they'll give up wrestling altogether. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been wrestling for a few years, but I, I was told my dad told me he said you listen to the Russian brute and you do what this man tells you because he won't steal you wrong. He's gonna teach you everything you need to know to hurt people. Just listen to him, and I'm I'm doing it. I'm listening to every word he's got to say. Oh, that's so great. Uh. Russia Brute, I've got to ask you, you know, as one of the few uh, very talented wrestling managers on the indie scene right now, uh, how does it feel to be what's considered the last of a dying breed? Very rarely do you see somebody with a manager. Uh, so how does that feel to, to actually be a manager on the indies right now? Well, as my good friend Bruce Brody would to me several times, Brute, you go ahead. You be an outlaw. Don't listen to Vince McMahon. Don't listen to Eric Bischoff. Don't listen to Jerry Jarrett. Be your own man, and you're going to be the best wrestler in the world today. Um, is there any influences as far as being a manager? What, what do you consider to be your management style? Uh, being from Russia, do you know, you make Ox drink tons of vodka and run through the snow and lift logs that like we saw in Rocky, or is it more refined and streamlined? All that stuff is irrelevant. That is the movies. That is acting. <laughs> my good friend, Skander Akbar, once told me, he said, Brute, you got the tools. It's just what you're going to do in the ring is what's important. So when I get into the ring, I hurt them. I destroy them. I teach them a lesson. And there's nobody going to be there to stop me. And that is what I'm going to offer Ox Baker Jr. Because Ox has the tools. He just has to listen now. Now, Ox, you know, you of course you have a very famous name, uh, being the son of Ox Baker, a wrestling legend and Hall of Famer. Uh, how much pressure is that to live up to the name? And is it a constant weight on your shoulders to try to be, to, to try to make your own name in the business? Oh, let's see, let's see here. Is it a constant pressure? To be, a, be the, to try to carry on the name of Ox Baker. Hey, I tell you what. He told me go out there and you hurt people. And when they get up and they look at you and you look them in the eye and you don't feel no remorse for them, you kick them right in the face and you tell them you don't know what you're doing. Get out of the ring. You're in the ring with Ox Baker Jr. And that's all you have to live up to. You live up to what you do, what you make of this business, son. You do it. You make. This thing yours. You make it that's why he told me it's not the hurt punch for no other reason but the fact that it's yours. You took the heart punch and you changed it into the hurt punch. And that's what I'm using. I use the hurt punch. Whoa, whoa, Ox Baker Jr. Don't you say that now, you get in trouble. The Russian brute has the heart punch. And it was No, no, I game. use the hurt punch. The hurt punch. I'm not saying, I, 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 I have a variation. I have my own variation of the move. He told me that he wanted me to carry on the hurt punch because it is the move that he created. And he taught the hard punch to the Russian brute. And the Russian brute is the master of the hard punch. And I am not stepping on any toes there because I see the Russian brute on a daily basis. And I know what the man can do. And I'm not afraid of him, but I respect him, and I respect everything he's done in this business and everything he's going to do in this business with me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to make a legacy, and I'm going to continue on Ox Baker's name, and it's not going to be – I'm not feeling pressure to do it. I know what I can do because I got the man behind me, the Russian brute. And that's all I, I got to say. 
I'm going to go on to greatness because of what I know I can do and what that man is teaching me to do more. And if that didn't now, make any okay. sense, I don't know. <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, you see, Alex Jr. You said you see the Russian brew on a daily basis. And, of course, this guy's your Mitchell, this guy's your trainer. What is a daily, what is it the average day, what does your training consist of as far as working out, your workout regimen, uh, your meals, uh, how often you eat, what do you eat, uh, any kind of tape or footage you watch? What does the daily, the average day of training consist of for you and the Russian brew? Well, before oh, the Russian brew. <laughs> let me take this one off. You, you got it. This one. Listen, Ox Baker does not have to do push ups and shit ups and get in front of the camera and make himself look pretty. It's not tough enough with us. We are tough. We are destroyers. It's just a matter of time before these so-called acting federations notice us for what we are. We are destroyers. We get into the ring, and we beat the hell out of each other than anybody who gets into the ring with us. That's going to make us tough. That is going to make us make our mark. And what we do is we go out, and we take care of ourselves and we eat properly, a lot of potato pancakes, a lot of lamb and a lot of goat. We eat the things from the motherland and that prepares us to get us big and strong. You see how big and strong we are, right? So all we need to do right now is focus on getting into the ring. We don't do no jogging, no jump rope, none of that CC American stuff. We do big stuff. We go get big steel gears. We get big giant tires. We get toilet bowls. We do things that, that are important in wrestling. Well, gentlemen, I see that, you know, of course, y'all wrestle. You know, both Russian or you're Russian. Russian brute. Oz Baker, you know, I'm assuming that you grew up in America. Uh, but you have a lot yeah. of pride in yourselves. Uh, how do you feel the, co the competition here is in America as how it would be? In Russia, do you feel the competition here in America is better and that's why you're here? Or do you think that, you know, most Americans are just, you know, sissy, girly men and stuff and easily ran over? Well, I tell you what. The American people are very weak. They want to be baby. They want to be pacified. They want you to tell them, oh, you did a good job today. In Russia, it don't go that way. If the Kremlin tells you what to do, you do it. I tell Alex Baker what to do, he does it. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were wrestling in the ring with Bobo Brazil Jr. Alex Baker was beating him into the ground. I told Alex, pick him up one more time and give him the heart punch. And then Bobo said, please don't hurt me, Alex Baker Jr. Please don't hurt me. I said, pick him up again. And then Alex Baker got the big baseball bat with the nails in it. And they strike him in the arm. And now Bobo Brazil is out of wrestling for the present time. And he said, please don't hurt us. Please don't hurt me. I got wife and kids. And the Kremlin, that's what they tell us to do. To destroy them and teach them a lesson. All right, well, gentlemen, uh, I feel I've gone through and watched a lot of your matches. Uh, and I watched, you know, of course, you guys work so great together. Uh, as a duo, are there anybody else that's in your area, in the, the Midwest, Indiana area, uh, that you see that has potential that can basically hit the road and go with you or somebody that, that you would like to consider, um, Ox Jr., that you could mold them into being a protege of yours? Of mine? Hmm. I don't know. I, I'd have to, uh, refer to the Russian brute. He's been keeping an eye out for younger talent and, uh, he's been looking for maybe a tag team partner for me. Or somebody that uh, we could beat on and beat them into shape. Well, R Russian Brute, have you got any eyes out there on anybody that you've seen lately that, you know, could be worth two spits? There's one guy, he named Russ Jones. He, he really, a real, real big, strong guy. But he got oh, a yeah. problem. He needs oh, to yeah, we definitely, in check. Yeah, we, we definitely we had... Uh, Brute, we whip him into shape. Really? Because what I'm saying, we've had Russ Jones as a, as a guest here on the Other Steel Wrestling Show, and we've talked to him extensively. And you're right, he is a huge, huge freak of nature. Uh, Russian Brute, do you think you have what it takes to quote unquote get him in, get his attitude in check and whip him into shape? Well, a guy like Russ Jones, 
you have to work him hard. You have to keep him in the ring. You have to show him and teach him how to talk to people and how to understand the business because there is so much controversy in business today. If you not kiss ass, you're not going to go anywhere. Russians don't kiss ass. Ox Baker Jr. don't kiss ass. And Russian Blue don't kiss ass. We show you what we can do. And we are big, massive, strong, individual athletes. And we are, we say what we do. And you can look at the film. Bobo Brazil Jr. learned a big lesson a couple of weeks ago. He don't want to get in the ring with us no more. Well, hey, is there anything um we got to ask you guys? What do we have coming up right now, uh, Russia Brew and Alex Baker? Anything, any events you have coming up, any challengers, any championship titles that you're going after? They're all afraid of us. Nobody want to come in the ring with us. We've already set precedent. We, the word is out that we are going to destroy anybody. And everybody they goes, watch that Russian brute and that crazy Alex Baker with that hurt punch. Alex Baker Jr., he's big and strong now. And he's going to hurt somebody. We don't want to get a ring with him. So we have to wait for a promoter to call us because, you know, we've, we've already taken care of business. Right, Ox? Oh, yeah. You, you've got that right. We've taken care of a lot of business. And we need to take care of a lot more. There's a bunch of guys out there screaming and whining. They don't want to get in the ring with me because they're afraid I'm going to hurt them. But you know what? If I get in the ring with them, I am going to hurt them. And I'm going to love every damn minute of it. Yes, you've got these wrestling federations with all of these five foot three guys in it. Pro Wrestling King, Strong Arm, all these indie federations. They're all afraid of Russian Brute because Russian Brute, real wrestler. They're just backyard wrestlers. They don't want to get in the ring with me because then they hold, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on now, bro. Hold on now, Russia, bro. Yeah, so you yeah, saying yeah, that? Yeah. Are you saying that any fight that that smaller that there's no place for smaller guys in professional wrestling, and that anybody who's like I, five, no, five, five, six not, or under the backyarder? Typical American, not listening. I say in in the area, all little guy. You got oh. Chris Curtis now. He big star now. Going to to uh to uh Jeff Jarrett right now. Big star. You got a couple of big guys. You got Russ John, and uh, you got uh, uh Brutus. You got you got a couple guys, but the majority of of guy American little small guy. They all cry. Oh, Russian brute hit me hard. Oh, Russian brute did this with hot punch. Russian. Brute. They cry too much and they complain instead of get their their revenge in shape. And get ready and show some real wrestling. They want to talk on the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But they never do it. It's so funny. I I sit and watch. It's so funny. It's like watching cartoon. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, speaking of one small guy, you know, a very good friend of the Undisputed Wrestling Show, Troy Miller, uh, is the ICW champion up there in Indiana, and he's not very tall. He's very short of stature, but he's the franchise. He calls himself the franchise. He's, I'm pretty sure, you know, he's taking on a lot of challengers, Abyss and a lot of other guys. How do you think that, you know, Ox Jr. would face against Troy Miller, who has a proven track record against guys much bigger than him? Ox Baker, this guy cannot hold a candle to Ox Baker Jr. Ox Baker going to slap him in his face and tell him how real wrestling is. And, uh, and if Ox can't do the job, I'm going to get him back in the ring and I'll straighten him out. But I, I know I'm going to straighten this guy out. If he undisputed champion, we put open challenge right now. I don't hear open. nothing from him. Are you, hold on. Are you saying an open challenge to Troy Miller versus Ox Jr.? I did not stutter, did I? No, you didn't. I was just making sure I got it correct. That way, if Troy's listening to the show or uh, uh, tomorrow, you know, while he's on the road traveling and stuff, I want to make sure that he gets all the details that, hey, Troy Miller, if you're listening, Ox Jr. is putting an open challenge out there to you for your championship. But what is Ox Jr. going to give up if he loses to Troy Miller? Ox Baker's not going to lose, so there's nothing to give up. You people in America, <laughs> you, always think, you always think you're champion. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When I met Hulk Hogan, he was big sissy. Big sissy. He said, oh, Russian Brood hit me too hard. Oh, I don't want to get in the ring with him. All these big so-called super superstars want to be big shots. Get your ass in the ring, and 
we show you what Big Shot is. All right. Roy well, Miller. Miller. <laughs> another ah, so guy think, in Indiana. Okay. Well, you know, I would come there and I would challenge you myself, but for some reason. Every wrestler and promoter in the state of Indiana is scared of the, the NWA Continental Champion. Uh, so basically, I'm just going to like fly myself up that way and stuff and just sit in somebody's you front range and challenge them. You know what? I hear that stuff in, in the locker room. They talk about you. They're all afraid oh. of you, too. <laughs> they all, they, 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 see, that's because you represent competition. The Russian Brute represent Nightmare. Ox Baker represent Hurt Punch. They don't want to get us in the ring because they know they're going to lose their title, they're going to lose the payday, and they're going to lose face. This is a typical American move. They think they're very strategic people, but they're not. They're just stupid, 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 afraid, afraid, afraid. If they want to be big wrestlers, they need to get in the ring like people like yourself, myself, and Ox Baker Jr., these names are names of substance. Well, hey, Russian Brute, what do you and Ox Baker have coming up pretty soon? Where, where can our listeners and fans and stuff, where can they go and actually see you guys in action and see Ox Baker hurt somebody? Ox, you got anything to say? You, you doing, you doing the show right now. Go ahead. Oh, wait, wait, no, no. He asked me, he asked you where we're going to be. I, I, I I just I'm like you you you're doing all the you're doing all the oh, promotion oh, and everything. I I ain't gonna step okay. on your toes, big man. Where are we gonna be well, at? We, huh? we, well, I don't have book in front of me. Uh, we well, got yeah, to right, right. How did you tell us? Excuse me, Ox. Ox, do you know you're gonna win? Ox, you can tell us if you know. Please tell us what's the next the next chance or the next opportunity that our listeners and fans. Not only in Indiana, but in the Midwest, because we have a huge following in the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan. Uh, where's the next time or uh, the next opportunity they get a chance to see you actually go into the ring, step into the ring with some puny American and hurt somebody? <laughs> uh, if, if, I, if I had my brothers, it would be every day of the week I get in the ring and, and beat somebody up. I um, I'm, I'm at a loss right here because I don't have a, I don't have a schedule in front of me either and I'm getting a little meased off about it. So uh I guess what we can say right here is you go to uh T R B Sports one dot weebly dot com and you can look it up there and we'll have a list of all the shows that are coming up and you can watch some uh video of me and maybe some video of my manager and the man and the myth and the legend, the Russian brute. And you go there on that site and you check it out. That's uh T R B Sports one dot weebly dot com and uh other than that i don't i'd have to go there and find out myself because uh you know i get hit in the head for a living and uh i forget things sometimes well mm. you know what my friend what we're really doing right now is we we developing ox right now we're getting them ready for this this uh tough enough sissy stuff they they said they're looking for some guy to come out yeah we want this we want that we don't want to live in a in a in a room with a bunch of sissies. We want to just show up to the main events and show them how tough enough we are. But Vince McMahon and and uh, Triple J or whatever you call him, they don't want that. They want to say, let's check out that emotional side of it. Our emotions are this: hurt, destroy, teach lesson. Nobody going to be there to stop us. And then let's get us in the ring. We want to get in the ring and, and, and beat up on some of these, like, superstars that they got, like these uh, these uh, Randy Orton's and, uh, you know, people who know how to wrestle. Randy Orton, uh, Mike Rotunda's kid wrestled there. DiBiase kid wrestled there. These are wrestlers we want to get into the ring with us because these are the wrestlers that know how to wrestle. These other guys, they got the super kick and the Superman punch. You know, that's all a bunch of baloney. The hurt part. Hey, gentlemen. Well, listen, hey, gentlemen, I know that you already told them the website and stuff for them to go and watch your matches and get your schedule out. Is there any other social media that you have that you would like to give our listeners and our fans so they can contact you and follow you, your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, any, any other social media that you have out there that you would like for our fans and listeners to know? 
Well, I, I know I'm on Facebook. It's the real Ox Baker Jr. And then I'm also on the Instagram and the and the Twitter is Ox, Ox Baker Jr. or at Ox Baker Jr. So I, I'm not that hard to find. You just type in Ox Baker Jr. and you can find me about everywhere. All right. Where about to, you, I try to Blue? post stuff. <laughs> well, Russian and, Blue now have TRB Sports number one dot Weebly dot com. You can come out and see Russian Brute, and Russian Brute have reading program. Russian Brute not all bad guy. He have good reading program, and you go to website and you can see Russian Brute read to the little kitties, and they pile on. Kids get Russian Brute a pile on. Fifty kids jump on Russian Brute, and we have a lot of fun. I go out to all over the country and read to the kids, and you know we have fun. Ox Baker come with me, and uh, but he kind of scared you know. The kids scared of him. <laughs> he's scary. He's scary. Out of I have to, I have to put the bag over his head sometimes. They, the kids get scared, but that not really <laughs> to him. So you go to the website uh, www.trbsport1.weebly.com and you see some good stuff from Russian Brute. Russian All Brute right. and Ox Baker Jr. do have a little, a little heart, but we like to break hearts too. Oh, so you do have a soft side. Okay. Well, gentlemen, I would like to thank y'all for being a guest on our show. I really do appreciate it. Uh, we're definitely going to talk to Rick and Zane and stuff and get you guys back on. How does that sound? It sounds, sounds good, good to me. And, uh, anybody out there you want to get into the ring with Hawks Becker, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you later, all right? That's for thank Daniel, you very much. Thank you. Have good a good night. night. You too. Thank you. Good night. Once again, ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ox Baker Jr. and his manager, the Russian Brute. Two big, burly, throwback old school guys who, you know, just want to go out there and hurt people. Once again, I'm your host for tonight, the NWA Continental Champion, the Morning Star, Will Huckabee. Uh, talking right now for our prophet, Rick Craig, and Das Wonderbeer, Zane Payton, who couldn't be with us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Before we leave, once again, I want to tell you to check out WrestleWorks.com. Uh, it's an online community for wrestlers, managers, promoters, bookers, valets, even wrestling fans. Uh, you go up there, connect, talk wrestling and stuff. Make sure to go to the Angry Marks faction. Let them know that you're a fan of the show and that you listen to us every time we post a show. Also, go to tshirtworldorder.com. Go ahead and get some of your favorite t-shirts from some of your favorite guys, such as the franchise Troy Miller, the Bronze God Norris, I had your favorite wrestling podcast, The Undisputed Wrestling Show. Go ahead, you know, order your shirt, take a picture, send it to us. We'll put you on Facebook or Twitter or the Instagram, whatever the case may be. You know, we'll talk to, we'll talk to Kevin about that. Uh, once again, like I said, coming up, was it June 25th or 27th? Which one is it, Kev? 26. Okay, June 26th. Heroes and Legends in the great state of Indiana where Will Huckabee is not allowed there for some reason. This is the official podcast for Heroes and Legends. Coming up very soon, we have a lot of great wrestlers who will be there. Hopefully, I can get there and be at Heroes and Legends and actually get to meet Zane and Rick in person because for some reason, ladies and gentlemen, we've been doing the show for over a year and we've never met face to face. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. Uh, Ken, have you got anything coming up pretty soon? Anything going on on the Angry Marks podcast this week that you know our fans and listeners should know about? Everything has been in such flux this week, I can't even say. You're just going to have to pay attention to the website, and you're going to have to pay attention to Twitter, at Angry Marks. You're going to have to pay attention to Facebook, Angry Marks Network. And you're just going to have to to pay attention whenever Stevie puts out an update, because things have been moving along here so fast, we can just barely keep up. We're hanging on by the seat of our pants this week. All right. Well, as for me, Kevin, I got a pretty big... Well, not a huge weekend, but you know, I got a couple of things going on. Uh, Friday night, I will be at, uh, PWF. Uh, that's a great promotion down there in Hubert, North Carolina. If you're anywhere in coastal Carolina, that's, uh, you know, anything east of Raleigh, you've got to come to PWF in Hubert, North Carolina. Uh, it's ran by Steve Carino. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's Steve Carino, Mr. Wrestling, the ROH, uh, commentator and Hall of Famer, in my opinion. Uh, he was a great show. I'll be there. My buddy Joe Black will be there. Uh, I've heard rumors that C.W. Anderson might be there. So check them out. Also go check out their Facebook page, PWF. You know, it, it's a great company. Um, 
I got a reggae concert going on this weekend. Um, it's a whole reggae festival, actually, Kevin, where like during the daytime, I'm signing autographs and taking pictures and selling my merchandise and everything. And then, and then that night, I'm like the special guest DJ for a reggae concert, even though I'm not Jamaican or Caribbean or Islander or whatever. But I guess I'm pretty awesome. You know, being a champion has its perks. So that's where I'll be at this weekend. Yeah. You should come check it out. Yeah, you should come check it out, Kev. You like reggae music? Well, I don't know if I'm gonna be quite that close to the area, so. But we're, <laughs> but I'll just, but I will just say this: even if you can't get to get out to see Will this weekend because you know you're three states away, you know, always support your local professional wrestling organizations. If you don't know where one's happening, get in touch with somebody. You know, at you know there there's this re- great resource called the internet, and there's this great resource called Facebook and Twitter. You know, all these wrestling promotions are out there busting their humps, trying to find new fans. If you're not watching wrestling this weekend, go find some, seriously, because there's plenty of it, plenty of good stuff out there. Exactly. Thank you for saying that, Kev. You're amazingly awesome. You know, speaking of wrestling, Will, did you happen to watch the Payback pay-per-view this weekend? Negative. Uh, I was actually, what was I doing Sunday? Oh, I was at PWX. Um, they had a great, great show. Like the main event was uh always star Cedric Alexander, Ricochet, um, Dragon Gate and Evolve Star, uh Caleb Conley, and then one of my favorite guys, uh, who's really making the name is about to take his first tour of China, the Southern Savior, uh, John Scholar, like an incredible four way uh for the main event where PWX ended up having a brand new champion. Congratulations to John Scholar. Um, I can say that because even though in his promo he said he didn't want any smart marks putting him over, I'm not a smart mark, I'm one of the boys. So I can say congratulations, John Schuyler, uh, on your recent win and being the PWX champion. Uh, but, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. Like, I was at PWX at uh, this really cool big view. It's called The Label in Charlotte. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you live in, like, the Charlotte, Greensboro, Winston-Salem area, go check that club out. It's it's designed for professional wrestling. Let me put it to you like that, Kevin. It has, like, three different, like, three stories tall, all looking down at the wrestling ring. They have a huge, you know, Titan Tron screen, uh, with like an elevated stage and stuff. The staff was really friendly. They got like 16 bars and stuff. It was amazing. <laughs> wow. Sounds awesome. Sounds, it, sounds like you had a big weekend. I had a crazy weekend. I was in like Memphis and I had to drive back and I had PWX and <sighs> yeah, the life of a road warrior. That's all I can say. You're just, you're just keeping it rolling. Just, I've spent about um, 50 hours in the car this weekend. It was 16, 16, five, yeah, about 50 hours in the car driving this weekend. Yeah, right. I, I put in some driving myself, so I, I definitely understand all about that life. So, oh, but you, but how, that, was the, how was the paper, payback pay per view? How was that? It was a fairly good pay per view, I, I must say. Um, you know, I really have not kept up with WWE in the last month. Really not had any interest, but one of the things I, I do definitely like is no matter if WWE Raw is up or down, you know, or if, if everything just absolutely stinks, when it comes time for a pay-per-view, all of those wrestlers pull it together and, and they're able to pull out an enjoyable show. So even if you don't know what's happened for like the last month, if you watch a WWE pay-per-view, you don't necessarily need to know that if you just watch it just for the wrestling that happens they're able to tell a good story right there in the ring i'm i'm really happy with with the current crop of wwe wrestling and where a lot of things are going i may not always agree with the storylines but when it gets down to the wrestling and and the men and women who are in there taking the bumps and and making the action happen, they're they're pulling it together, and I really did enjoy watching the pay per view. I enjoyed um, what little bit of wrestling WWE I did see was obviously uh, Kevin Steen or Kevin Owens and John Cena's you know promo they yeah, had was, in the ring, and was, that was probably the most interesting thing on Facebook and Twitter. I was this gonna week. I was gonna say, please tell me you at least saw Owen, Owens and Cena's segment. You know what? I saw that one and I will give it, I will give John Cena so much credit because in my opinion, John Cena is probably the hardest working man in professional wrestling. And I think he's finally got to a point in his career where he's comfortable putting a lot of guys over. Um, 
and he's really been putting a lot, even though, you know, of course he hasn't been actually losing, but the matches he's had with guys like Sami Zayn and Neville and in his spot last week with, uh, with this past week with Kevin Owens, this guy is doing his best to set up WWE for the future. And I really tip my hat to him because he doesn't have to. Uh, but he really, he's really putting these guys over and stuff and, and really giving these guys a push. So what I was disappointed was, was the horrible bump that Sheamus took, uh, in his match against Ryback. You know, he took a powerbomb spot and it was like his arms was all over the place. He was reaching. And as one of the boys in the back, we know that's the worst thing you can do is reach on a bump until it reach behind you. And there's a big risk for like breaking your arms and your elbows and your wrists and stuff. And he just looked horrible. Yeah, I I caught that as well as uh, I cringed. Yeah. So. But they but, but anyway, but they but ahead. they still but they still managed to finish it up okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like the whole spot they're doing with Neville and stuff uh with him being 5 foot 3 but you know, being an incredible physical spe- specimen and stuff. I I love his matches with everybody that he's having and stuff. It, it really Playing off the, the little man, big man. I guess he's like the new Rey Mysterio now. What do you think? I guess so. You know, I I made a comment a couple of weeks back. I didn't I didn't realize that Adrian Neville was was as short as he was. I mean, I mean, always looking at him on TV, you know, I I just assumed he was kind of like six foot something. But I tell you what, I mean, somebody told me, you know, he was short, and I you know I just had to take a, I went and looked on on Wikipedia then and, and saw yeah he's, he's shorter in stature. But I didn't really see it until I found a a cache of clips. I don't know. I don't know if if NXT or Florida Championship Wrestling and, and WWE had put these out a couple of years ago. If they were leaked or something, but they were a series of um um oh I I I don't want to say skits. Um, it, it's they were they were like practicing promos and scenarios and stuff and in front of it like a black stage cloth and there were other students there it was clearly not meant to be you know a a finished tv product you know they they were they were practicing and i i saw a segment with uh with mason ryan do you you remember him right of course i remember him mason ryan and it was neville and um one other guy i i didn't immediately recognize and i had to look him up and I, apparently he was there for about a year and got cut and I, I can't even remember his name off the time but they they were doing like this the skit the stand up skit to to practice their promos and stuff and that's when i noticed you know adrian neville looked like a, almost a whole foot shorter than mason ryan i'm like wow i mean he I, I can understand now why why they almost want somebody suggested that they were going to give him the uh, the the new moniker of of the Mighty Mouse because that's kind of what he looks like now that now that exactly. I've actually now that I've actually seen his stature you know he's you know I'm and with his build and everything I'll, I'll give credit to this um, Raw Reaction host Angry Tenzai compared him to the next Chris Benoit. Because he, and, and, wow. because, because he's, he has that short stature, but he is physically stacked and he is a presence in that ring. Um, you know, I, you know, no promo skills, appreciable promo skills that we've seen on Raw yet. You know, he's got some okay yeah. skills that we've seen from NXT, but you know, like, you know, like Benoit, Benoit was, wasn't really about the promo skills at all. It was the physical presence he brought in that ring. And even though he may be shorter, he's going to be a big man standing in that ring. He, you are not going to be able to ignore Neville. Oh no, not at all. Not at all. Well, Kev, I think that's about time, all the time we have for this week. What do you think? I think we're ready to wrap it up. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I'm your host, the NWA Tonnell Champion, the Morning Star, Will H- William Huckabee. The other guy you just heard, that's the greatest producer in all of wrestling and music, and just the greatest producer in podcast history, period, my homeboy, Killer Kev, on behalf of the prophet Rick Craig, on behalf of Das Wonderbeard, the bearded wonder Zane Paisley, Killer Kev, Stevie J, and all the great guys over here at the Angry Marks Podcast. I am William Huckabee. I am your NWA Continental Champion, and I'm signing out. In the words of Dana Lynn Bailey, peace out, Cub Scouts.